Hello ladies and gents, Sina here. In this video, I'm going to show you how to create this type of reverse fracture effect. It's an effective way to add some style to your environmental animations, or if you're building a platformer game. One great example of its use in game design was in the game Bastion, developed by the indie team Supergiant Games. We'll be doing this in Blender 3 using a rather small geometry node setup and a free add-on called Cell Fracture. So without further delay, let's jump into it. Let's start by activating a free add-on from the add-ons library. To do this, open the preferences window from the edit menu. Then go to the add-ons tab and find the cell fracture add-on using the search field. This is a free add-on that comes bundled with Blender, so you don't need to install anything. Simply, just turn on the checkbox to activate it. Now if you head over to the object menu, under the Quick Effects group, you can see the Cell Fracture option. With that out of the way, now add a cube to the scene. Switch to Edit Mode and scale the cube along the X, Y, and Z axes. Then, give the cube a proper name. I'm going to name this cube Bridge. Add a material to the bridge object and rename it to something more appropriate like Bridge Material. Before we use the Cell Fracture add-on, we need to add some particles to the object. This is easier than you might think. Simply, go to the Particles tab and add a particle system by clicking on the plus sign. There are many parameters on a particle system, but fortunately, we only need to worry about three of the fields. First, the number of particles. This will determine how many fracture pieces you can potentially have. I'm going to set this to 500. Second, the frame number where the system starts emitting particles. And finally, the frame number where particle emission ends. The important thing here is to set the end frame to be the same as the start frame. This will make sure that all 500 particles are created at the same time. Now, to see all of the particles, we need to move the animation tab over to the frame we had selected in the particle system. For me, this would be frame 0. So with 500 particles in place, select the object, and from the object menu, select the Cell Fracture option. You'll be presented with this window where we only need to change three of the fields. First, change the source limit to be the same as your particle count. Second, change the margin value to zero. This will remove any gap between the fractured pieces. And finally, in the collection field, type a name for the collection you want all fractured pieces to be put in. If you leave this field blank, all the pieces will be placed in the currently active collection, which will cause a mess when you have hundreds of pieces. We won't be touching any of the other fields here, but I suggest you play around with them if you're curious to see what they do. Or if you want me to make a tutorial explaining all the options, let me know in the comments. In any case, we're finished with these settings, so press OK and wait while a whole lot of Boolean operations take place in the background to produce the 500 fractured pieces we're after. When the fractured pieces or cells are created, you can go ahead and hide the original bridge object from the viewport and the render, since we won't be dealing with it anymore. Now, just before we get into the geometry node setup, we need to add a second object. The purpose of this object is to help animate the reverse fracture effect. As you see here, this object determines the edge between the fractured side and the non-fractured side of the bridge. Here, I'm going to use a plane and name it Edge. I'm also going to add some keyframes to it so we can review the reverse fracture animation while we build the geometry node setup. You can add these keyframes by moving the animation tab to a specific frame, then move the edge object to its target location, and finally right click on the location transform to add a keyframe. And with that out of the way, we can now head over to the Geometry Nodes viewport. The way we're going to set up our Geometry Nodes is to have the Reverse Fracture effect take place on a proxy object. So after hiding the collection that contains the cells from the viewport, let's add a plane as the proxy and rename it to Geometry Nodes. 
Then go to the Modifiers tab and add a Geometry Node modifier to the object. This will create a new Geometry Node pipeline and populate it with a Group Input node and a Group Output node. We don't need the Group Input node, so let's delete it. Then, using the Add menu and the Search field, bring in a Collection Info node, a Scale Instances node, a Translate Instances node, and a Set Material node. The Collection Info node allows us to use information about a specific collection in our Geometry node setup. Make sure to switch the toggle from Original to Relative so that the information updates whenever you make a change to the Source collection. Then, select the Cells collection from the Source field. And finally, turn on the Separate Children option so that each object in the collection is treated as a separate object. On the Translate Instances node, make sure to turn off the Local Space checkbox. On the Set Materials node, select the material you had previously created for the bridge. The Scale Instances node enables us to scale the fractured pieces along any axis. However, at this point, this node scales the entire collection equally, which is not what we're after. The same goes for the Translate Instances node, where the entire collection is moved all together. To individually scale each of the fractured pieces, use the Add menu and the Search field to bring in a Position node, an Object Info node, two Vector Math nodes, and a Map Range node. The Position node provides information about each of the objects present in the collection we have specified in the Collection Info node. In other words, the Position node gives us the location of each individual fractured piece. The Object Info node provides information about any specific object we select in its source field. Make sure to switch the toggle from Original to Relative and select the Edge object we had created earlier as the source for this node. Set the first vector math node to subtract the output of the position node and the location output of the object info node. The result of this subtraction will be a vector pointing from the Edge object to each fractured piece. The second vector math node, when set to calculate the dot product, gives us a float value reflecting the distance between each fractured piece and the edge object. Using the second vector input of this node allows us to specify which axis we want the distance to be projected onto. Here, I'm going to have this projection along the x axis. The map range node is where the distance is converted to a float value for the scale instances node, meaning that you can change the scale of each fractured piece based on its distance from the edge. With this branch of nodes complete, we can play the animation to see the reverse fracture effect while the edge object moves along the bridge. As you can see, each individual fractured piece gradually scales to its full size as the edge object approaches its location. You can tweak the distance of the reverse fracture effect using the parameters of the map range node. At the same time as the pieces scale up to form the bridge, we can also have them move into location as the edge gets closer. To do this, let's add another map range node and a combined XYZ node. Same as the previous one, this map range node converts the distance output of the vector math node into a float value. The float value is then used by the combined XYZ node to create a vector along the Z direction. This vector is then passed on to the translate instances node, which will move each fracture piece along the Z axis. Use the parameters of the map range node to determine the distance that each piece moves as the bridge is formed. In addition to that, on the dot product node, you can use the second vector input to determine which side of the edge should be fractured. 
different combinations of the parameters of these notes enable you to create a variety of effects that can be drastically different from each other. Here are some examples along with their parametric values. If you want to learn more about Blender's geometry and shader notes, consider watching this next video.